704. I'll call it 705, close enough. We'll get started here. It increases the odds of winning the free book. If there's a small group here, one in five chance of a free book tonight. Mm -hmm. You gotta oh, stick it out. Hmm? Yay. 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 Okay. Although I think I own the book. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have over 60 books I'm in on, on Amazon. So oh, all right. There you go. <laughs> then I don't. Most people don't own them all. Oh. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you all for joining me here. Really appreciating the chance to do my little part to try to keep spirits up as we're all sitting here locked in homes that we love to be in. We just don't want to be in them every hour of every day. <laughs> so I've been wanting to do find a way to do the Instant Story Show to new audiences for a while. And I finally decided this was the chance. This was an opportunity where I could give to people and get some practice in. Because as I mentioned earlier, I want to do this at more conventions. And it's hard to explain to the conventions what the Instant Story Show is in just text. Mm -hmm. Really, I need to have examples to show them. And so you folks are going to be one of my sample audiences. Yay. Oh, thanks. Yay. Sweet. So <laughs> the explanation of the Instant Story Show is basically you're going to give me a couple of prompts, and I'm going to tell a story from those prompts for uh, something like an hour, 45 minutes. It, when I hit an ending, that's the story. It typically runs about 40 to 45 minutes. I've seen it run an hour. I generally aim for less because at the typical convention, an hour is the whole session. Yeah. And I know there's going to be questions <coughs> afterwards. So... If I can see an ending coming before the hour point, I'll aim for it. But in the meantime, it's going to be entirely improvised, spontaneous, entirely dictated, because that's how I do my work in writing my fiction anyway. I get into my Jeep, drive to work, wherever that is these days, and I dictate for an hour each way. And so that's where my stories come from. And very often they are as improvised as this, that I start out with, hey, here's a concept, here's a character, here's a situation. Let's find out what happens. The last time I did one of these that really, really worked out was a story some of you are familiar with called Today I Am Paul. That was, mm -hmm. I had an idea in the shower in the morning. I dictated it on the way to work, and I pretty much sent it out as it was, except that my first reader suggested I change the last couple of paragraphs. They were right, but it was pretty much it was what came out of my mouth that morning. So this that was a good morning. Natural. <laughs> that was a great morning. That was also, I typically do about 25 words a minute when I'm dictating and driving. I did 100 words a minute that morning. I was just in the zone. I am not going to promise to be in the zone tonight. I am <laughs> going to do my best, but zone is not guaranteed. So... I'm going to get you to give me some prompts, and then I'm going to start dictating, and I'm going to rely on you folks to keep me honest. If you start to think that I am just hemming and hawing and stalling because I don't know where to go, I want you to say, hey, you're stalling. And I may not agree with you, but if I agree with you, I'm flipping over the 30-second <laughs> sand clock timer. And if at the end of that sand timer, I have not come up with a direction yet, I pull up the magic little instant story show deck. And I pull out a card which says something like, my big break. And okay, now I know what comes next in the story, my big break. I don't know what it has to do with it. It's my job to make it happen. Can we add one that says, and then Zeus appeared? <laughs> you know? <laughs> There might be one in there like that. <laughs> um, I, I, I went pretty random with some of these things. Okay. So, everyone understand where we're going? Yes. 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 So. And I can't promise that I won't talk myself into a corner and have no idea where to go. I have to say, though, I've generally managed to finish the story in every one of these 
except for the one where it's on a really good story and I was still going strong at 55 minutes and the next panel came along and said, you really need to get out of here. Oh. Now, colon, I have one question, comma, before we begin, period. Is me speaking the punctuation going to annoy the heck out of you, question mark? No. No. Yep, no, okay. it's fine. Dina right, because she finds herself doing that in real life now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The, the dictation with Dragon Naturally Speaking works better if I speak the punctuation. I never speak the <clears throat> quotation marks, I'll put those in later, but it works better if I speak the punctuation. It, the 15, which is the newest version, does interpolate punctuation if I don't speak it and does a moderate job but it does much better if I speak it, which is part of what's gonna happen is when I'm done here tonight, after I'm done, after we talk questions, after I give away a book, I'm going to take the transcription, put it into Dragon, and have it turned into an ebook by tomorrow morning. And if you send me your contact information again, I'll send you a file copy of it. Tell me if you want PDF or, I guess PDF is really all I'm set up for right now. I'll yeah. send you a PDF. I also will have it on Amazon as soon as I get a cover, which I don't know what the cover is going to be yet because I don't know what the story is going to be. But <laughs> as soon as I get a cover and get it approved by Amazon, I'll have it up there for 99 cents. But you folks will get one for free. Yay. Yay. And then after the story itself is done, we've got a couple of writers here at least. And so I would be willing to answer any questions about how I'm doing the dictation, how my story planning works, how do I do planning when I've got no idea what the story's going to be and so on. We'll have a little time probably to talk story mechanics if anyone's interested in that. All right? Okay. Sounds good. Phoebe likes All the right. idea. <laughs> Colleen, you might want to unmute if you want to participate in this next prompt section. All right, because I need three prompts from my audience. Pandora's box. I need three things. First, I need a job or a responsibility or a duty or an assignment that someone has to carry out. Courier. A courier. Man, you're making it easy for me. Okay, good. Couriers get lots of trouble. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> All right. Now I need a setting. Where is this courier going to be? Uh -huh. uh, at a time oh. portal. At a time portal. Oh, good. And what is the initial, not necessarily the final, what is the initial problem that the courier has to deal with? A uh, person that they have to take the message to does not want to be found. An Ooh. elusive recipient. <laughs> Very good. And you snuck in a little bit of extra with that? because you said specifically that they have to take a message to, which takes one more decision off of my plate. So we have a courier with a message at a time portal and a recipient who doesn't want to receive the message for some reason. Next, I take out my handy dandy microphone or my handy dandy recorder. I'm wearing my handy dandy microphone. I take up my handy dandy recorder and do the necessary first thing before I actually start dictating so I don't end up with crap. Microphone test, 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 test. Very good. Very good. I learned the hard way. That if I don't do that, I can blow an hour of really good material that I'm going to have to try to remember later. Sounds oh, good. Boy. 
So now we are recording and I am off and going running about our courier. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take one change because you said he, but I think I like Elise as the name of my courier. Elise stared at the chronoscope and poured over the data looking for the traces that would indicate where Anthony was to be found. He had managed to slip past her one more time. And so once again, he was going to escape getting his official summons to the time court. Time court paid her really well because it was one of the hardest jobs to serve summonses for because you had to worry about all of human history and depending on when, that might be human history off the planet in order to track down the person who was trying to escape prosecution for their time crime. And Anthony had been escaping her for, depending on whose timeline you looked at, <laughs> at least 13 years. She suspected that for Anthony, it had been more like 23 years, but it was really hard to tell because he was good. As time criminals went, Anthony was the best she had ever come across. He was always able to wipe his tracks so that if you were not in time flux when he took his move, you would never know that he was there. You might never know that he existed. Fortunately, Elise spent a good chunk of her life in time flux for exactly this reason because Elise knew that one small mistake, one night spent letting her guard down in the south of France in 1573, and all of a sudden, time court itself might be lost to her. So she spent most of the time in time court or in the court building, someplace that was in time flux and protected from alterations by Anthony and his ilk. But this time, by no trace of him at all in the chronoscope. There were no unusual fluctuations, no signs of timelines changing, no signs of timelines collapsing. That was one of Anthony's favorite tricks. He would arrange for a timeline to disappear entirely, and along with it, all of the traces of where he had been. But there were no collapsing timelines that she could see now. Of course, now is a relative term when you serve the time court. Now has more than four dimensions of actual time flow. And so sometimes a thief could get away with moving off on a parallel dimension. So he wasn't moving in the timelines you were watching. He was moving in a different direction entirely. And he was absolutely motionless in the timelines you were tracking. She thought about where she might check various side timelines that had been tracked before. Side timelines were dangerous. You had to know what you were doing to be able to access one of those because you could potentially have your own personal timeline get fractured. And well, if that happened, then you didn't have to worry. Time in court wasn't going to have anything left to prosecute at that point. So, so parallel timelines, sidelines, those were less common. But she had no place else she could look now. So she started going through the catalog of parallel timelines. There was the sideline where the Romans had settled America. That was a timeline which had proceeded forward from then, but the jumping off point to it had happened when Anthony's partner, Bertram, That's a great name. Had stepped off into a sideline long enough that it started to develop its own separate presence. He started bringing enough material there that there was starting to be things to fix that parallel timeline in place. And suddenly, boom, there's Roman conquered America. That one had almost discovered time court themselves. They had unfortunately 
found themselves in a serious war with fractions of the factions of the Byzantines. And that had ended up as one of the sadly many nuclear Holocaust Earths. And so they never reached the point of time court. But before that point in time, it was a pleasant place to be. So she did move the chronosphere and tried to chase through the, that, to that timeline along the sideline that led to it. <clears throat> and what she found was that the sideline was broken. There was suddenly no reaching that timeline through that path. Had there ever been another path to that one? Everyone used the known sideline. She finally knew that she was over her head on this. She needed some consultation with Mac. Mac had had enough of the whole time court business. He had reached a point in his life where he was tired of not knowing what was going to happen when or what had happened when, and he decided it was time to become the archivist. And of course, again, time to become is a relative thing in this business, but everyone agreed Mac had had enough. If Mac wanted to run the archives now, more power to it. So Mac was now in charge of cataloging all the different timelines and all the sidelines that had been <clears throat> encountered by any of the agents of Time Court. So Elise reluctantly covered the chronosphere. You didn't want to leave it uncovered. Uh, that was prone to problems. Uh, with the wrong person came across and didn't have the proper training, it could be bad for their psyche to suddenly see all the many possibilities of timelines simultaneously. It had taken more than five years before Elise had been allowed to manage the chronoscope herself. So you have to cover it up. So she covered it. She went upstairs, at least it was upstairs in this version of the timeline. There'd been versions of Time Court that had come and gone in the past where the archives were deep in the basement. In this version, the archives were in a wonderful open air library at the roof of the Time Spire. And so up she went, up the slide walk, up to the roof to see, look in on Mac and see how things were going and ask him if he knew a way to get to the Roman American Earth timeline. But when she got there, the door was locked. This was the problem. Archives were never supposed to be locked. If Mac wasn't there, one of his assistants was supposed to be there. So she found herself <clears throat> hammering on the door, a very unusual situation here, and hammering and hammering and nothing happened. No one came. And she began to be worried. Had something happened to Mac? Was there trouble inside that had somehow involved Mac or one of his assistants? Had perhaps Anthony or someone worse come in and raided the archives for information? The archives were supposed to be secure. They were some of the most heavily chrono shielded parts of all of the Time Spire. But it was nothing Elise could do anything about. For this, she needed to have security. She tapped her comm badge, pressed the code for emergency, and inside of half a second, there were four guards there ready. Because of course, they had time viewing. They knew they were going to be needed. Not exactly sure when, not exactly sure why, but they were ready for the call because that's how you protect the time spire. Yes, ma'am, can we help you? Elise looked at the men. The archives are locked. What? The archives are locked completely. That's not possible. They can only be locked from the inside. I understand that. Can they be unlocked from the outside? Ah. Uh, for security reasons, they can only be unlocked from the inside as well. So what you're saying is, we can't get in until whoever's inside wants to let us in. The guard scratched his chin. 
that does seem to be the problem. We seem to have a small flaw in this plan. We never expected to have someone inside keeping someone outside who wasn't supposed to be kept out. Only people were supposed to be. All right, what can we do about it? Um, have you tried knocking? Yes, I tried knocking. Um, did you knock really loud? <laughs> as loud as I could. Um, at least realized that these guards might be competent, might be well trained, but they weren't necessarily the brightest ones in the group. But then she thought back to what she'd just been talking about, that the archives hadn't been here in one version of the Time Spire. They'd been downstairs. Things come and go in the Time Spire. She said, I've got it. Have you got a spire shifter? Certainly. Spire mm -hmm. shifters only travel within time flux itself. They couldn't take you out into the broader time stream. For that, you needed the big portal, or you needed one of the stolen portals, one of the black market portals that were used by some of the time criminals. But this would let her change to a different point in time, and then another point in time. Now, especially within time flux, there are rules. When you're in the time spire, you do not exist at the time that you have existed. This is a bad thing to do. So she knew she was outside this door. But she also knew she might not be outside this door 100 years ago. And she might not be outside this door in 30 seconds. And so she took the time porter, set her time back, 100 years, and she found herself in the time spire, not significantly different. Somebody had painted the walls a really ugly shade of green, but it looked like familiar territory. It didn't look like a change in the timeline. And then she set the time back to when she left, plus 30 seconds, after stepping forward two feet. And nothing happened. So she tried 30 seconds more, nothing happened. She tried two minutes and suddenly she was inside of the archives. First thing she did, of course, was open the door and let the guards in and handed back the time porter. Then she looked around and saw the absolute chaos. Data recording chips were everywhere scattered all around the room in just piles and piles. It looked like people had thrown them around, stepped on them, combed through them. Someone had been looking for specific information. And Mac was nowhere to be seen, nor were any of his assistants. Someone had left the room when the locked condition and had taken something with them, most likely, or they wouldn't have left after all this mess. So now Elise had more than just a summons to serve. She had a fugitive to find and a motive to figure out. This was going to be a chronal mystery. Of course, as these things happen, it takes a long time to chase down a chronal mystery. But they have time. They're in the time court. They're in time flux. It took more than six years of objective time to go through and look at every single archive record and find what was missing. In terms of the timeline of time, the time spire itself, it was about 20 minutes. That's the advantage of sidelines. You can spend an awful lot of time on a sideline and not worry too much about time on your own line. So they now knew that there were four chips missing and they had catalog titles for the four chips. And those four chips spoke of 
the Rome in America, of course, and another spoke of the Apollo plots. There goes a marker. And the third spoke of the land was it without cats. Was that 7.30 already? Wow. And the fourth spoke of the forestation. Elise knew that there wasn't going to be much opportunity to search out all of these possibilities. The more you search along a sideline, the more potential you have to change the main line. If she searched through all of them, she might cause yet more damage to the main line, while Anthony, if he was in fact behind this, got farther away, while Mac perhaps got further lost in time. So she had to decide which among these was the most likely place to search. Rome in America, she thought, was too obvious. If someone was trying to lay a trail to distract her, that was the one. Plus, at least temporarily, it was cut off. And there was no way to find it without the card that told all we knew about sidelines to it. So most likely, that one was taken to keep someone from getting to their destination. <clears throat> Looking at the rest, she thought the land without cats was not a particularly promising place just because it had turned out to be a sideline caused by someone who had an absolute allergy to cats. <laughs> and other than that, had no significant differences from the current timeline. There was no Garfield. There was no hang in there, baby Fridays coming. There was no B. Cliven. But there was mostly the same place. A change in the land without cats would have been a change in the standard timeline. So it would not be a place where it was useful to hide. So that left forestation and Apollo Plus. Forestation was a world <clears throat> where plants, where the trees basically grew faster. And so the replacement rate for trees was significantly above the rate of removal. And so pretty much the world was populated by cities with lots of woods in between them. Lots of woods, lots of places to hide, uh, possibility. Apollo Plus was a place where we just never gave up on the Apollo program. We did all the missions, we built the space station, we were on our way to Mars, we were exploring the other planets. Apollo Plus was a place that was very popular with members of the time court who tended to be technophiles. So among those two, she had to figure out which was the most likely. And she decided to follow the strategy that her father had given her. Her father had been an excellent bridge player, a game that Elise had never been able to make much sense out of. But she'd watched him play. And she'd watched him win hands night after night as if he could read the minds of the other players. And this was long before Elise learned about time court. So she'd never thought of time travel as a way of, of pulling this off. But she considered maybe mind reading. And she asked dad if he was a mind reader. And he said, no, absolutely not. But then how did you know to play this way? And he said, Elise, I call it playing as if. Play as if you've been dealt a winning hand. If you've been dealt a losing hand, it doesn't matter how you play. If you've been dealt a winning hand and you don't play it as if it's a winning hand, you're going to lose. But if you've been dealt a winning hand, play as if you've been a winning hand, been dealt a winning hand, and you will have the best odds you're going to get with something that's essentially random. 
with that point of view, she looked at the two and thought, if whoever is behind this has gone to Apollo Plus, they have a moon to, serve, to hide in, Mars, space stations, spacecraft in transit. They have so many places to go, so many possibilities, that even with all the time at my disposal, I won't be able to search it all. Laura Station, on the other hand, is a world where the cities have been clustered into very big chunks because you can't successfully build a city in most places. The trees will take it over before you can get there. Laura Station was a place you could search. So she finally decided that like the old drunk who searched for the keys under the lamppost because the light was better there, we could search the place that had the best chance for her to find Anthony if he was there. So now she just needed to find a way there, given that the charts were all lost on a data card. She thought, who else might know this information? Mac seemed to have disappeared. Mac's assistants were somewhere in the time spire. Would they know this particular sideline? Only one way to find out, she proceeded to go out to the social areas of the time spire and look for the assistants. She started asking around. And after more than two hours of searching, found that the assistants were just as impossible to find as Mac was. Now she was starting to be concerned. Now she needed to report to her superiors because this was now getting out of hand. Now it wasn't a fugitive, it was three time court personnel lost. So she made her way down to the main offices, lower in the building, and track down her boss, Ken. When Ken looked up from his desk, the first thing he said was, have you delivered that summons to Anthony yet? Elise shook her head. I wish it were just that, cow boss. Oops, I stuck in some punctuation there. I finally remembered. <laughs> I wish it were just that, boss. She explained the missing personnel and the missing data chips. And as she did, Ken's eyes grew wider and wider. This is an attack on us. It kind of looks that way. This is, what was the crime that we were delivering this summons for? I haven't even looked at the billing sheet yet. Anthony was once again being accused of creating a custom timeline, basically have a place where he could trade goods from another timeline and the goods that were utterly worthless there would make him a near emperor in that timeline. <sighs> that old game. All right, so have you looked at those timelines? Oh, I looked at those long ago. We've got them shut down pretty well. Are you sure? Then at least thought. Had she been led by the nose? Had she been following trail after trail after trail and forgetting where she started? Were these four missing chips yet one more clue to lead her on another path where she would get nowhere and find nothing. I don't know, boss. Let me check the chronoscope. Here, comma, Ken said, you can use mine. This was unusual. Ken usually didn't like anyone playing with his chronoscope. He had it tuned exactly the way he liked it. He had to be really worried if he was letting someone else fiddle with his settings. Elise would try not to mess it up too badly. So she stepped up to it, started resetting back to a known state and looking for 
the timeline that Anthony had created, no, it was still locked. There was no path to it that anyone in time court knew about. All right, what about the other? And then she saw the blip. The other timeline, the production timeline, that one had activity going on in it. The timeline was changing there. What was he producing? She pulled out the file. Cell phones? Is that it? Oh, wait, cell phone cell technology. She looked at the information on the manufactured timeline, and it was a world that had split off from the main timeline before the space program, before even the Soviet space program. Nothing had sparked the microprocessor revolution on that timeline. Nothing had caused the massive sweep of computers and the massive influx of modern technology, at least modern as far as the outside world knew it, nothing compared to time court. Nothing there had prepared them for this. But if nothing was prepared, she showed her findings to Ken and asked what he thought of this. He said, you know, I've heard of cases of economies that are behind the seats, the behind the um, behind the curve in technology, but start to grow, and they leapfrog because they never went through the older stages of technology. They adopt the newest stuff that their competitors have spent 30 years developing, and they go straight to that. Now, ask the average person out there in outside of the time flux if they could have had cell phones in 1960, how many of them would have ever cared to have a computer? Ah, so that was his plan. He'd have had to set up infrastructure for it, cell towers, all of that. Yep, look at the file. He wasn't just taking cell technology to the handheld. He was taking a lot of it. A lot of it, look boss, he's only one man. If he's only one man, how's he going to put up cell towers? Oh, the world he was taking it from was in the middle of a complete crush in the labor market. There was no work to be found. He was bringing laborers over. Laborers? But he'd need thousands, tens of thousands, maybe more. You can't take that many across the timeline. That'll change everything. Why do you think he's got a summons? We're going to be probably a century unraveling the mess that he's made. But now it looks like he's in the production timeline. See? And she showed him the blips. Something's changing there. It could be just echoes of him evacuating so many tech workers from there. It could, boss. But I'm afraid this is the only clue I've got. If he's someplace we can find him, I have to play as if he's there. All right, you're the agent in charge. I'll send down instructions to set the portal, and you can head on over there. Let's change the instructions just a little bit, she said. Let's set the portal back a month from current time. We're not seeing any sign of blips from that far back, right? Uh, there is one blip. Oh, well, we know what that is. And they laughed. Of course they knew what that is. That was the blip of Elise going downstairs and arriving a month back in time. One blip was fine. Multiple blips would be a problem. So as fast as she could, Elise got to the portal and went back a month in time into the world of ubiquitous cell phones. And she started her search. 
How are we doing on time? 7.44. I'm going to finish this one in an hour. It's only getting deeper. But I'll keep going to the end of the point, and then I'll see about finishing it later. Okay. So, Elise made a quick stop to get her supply kit from her locker. At least the timeline that was this close to standard and this close in time, she didn't have to worry about extraordinary costuming or unusual weaponry. Not that she worried that much about weaponry. The weaponry that a time court officer carried was generally above anything you would find in any timeline they visited. She didn't have to worry much about fitting in. She just had to find her way. And this was at least a timeline that had a geography that was mostly familiar to her. And so she could easily land in a city that she knew well, such as say Chicago where she'd grown up to find her way around. So they set the coordinates for Chicago a month back and she stepped through the portal. When she arrived, Somebody's got a bell. Yeah, oh, that's, that's our, our that's our phone. Ah, okay. I suppose if I can have a cuckoo, you can have a chime. <laughs> when she arrived, the first thing she noticed was ubiquitous cell phone usage was right. There were phones in the hands and or on the heads of every person on the street. More even than in the standard timeline. This looked, there were easily more phones than there were eyeglasses. This looked like a world where everyone was connected all the time. People wandering around talking to themselves, talking to their microphones, talking to their friends. She had seen worlds like this. She was even seeing it coming in the standard timeline and looking ahead had seen where the standard timeline would reach this point eventually where the people had for all practical purposes telepathy no they couldn't read each other's thoughts but most people don't want that on telepathy they want to be talking to their friends all the time no matter where they are or how far away they want to share their thoughts all the time no matter how mundane and this world clearly had that. It was a constant stream of conversation everywhere she went. It was loud, it was obnoxious, it was making her wish she had earplugs. In a world like this, people weren't paying attention to where they walked. Fortunately, they weren't driving much because the driving would have been even less safe, but the cell phones did much of their navigation for them. She could hear little beeps and clicks as phones warned people when they were about to walk into something dangerous. This was a world extremely dependent upon their cell phones. But she could also tell from the conditions on the street and the lack of upkeep and the general trash piled around everywhere that yes, this was also a world that had hit, been hit with an economic crisis fairly hard. It looked like Maintenance in the city streets was not something that was paid a lot of attention for. This was a world where people were kind of run down. As if having the ability to talk to your friends all the time didn't necessarily provide a whole lot of satisfaction and, and relevance in your life. As if it became a distraction. As if you weren't paying much attention to the world around you. And she could see that that might have led and had something like it had led to collapses on other worlds. So maybe Anthony had indeed found some tech workers willing to go on an extreme adventure. For them, it would be a distant commute. No doubt he would be making it appear to them as if they were in some sort of vessel transporting across the land as opposed to across time streams. So it would make sense that he would be able to convince people to take this opportunity. 
And this is why she had gone back in time a month. She wanted to find when he placed the ad for the workers and be there when it happened. So she looked around for a newspaper box and learned that in fact, such things, if they had ever existed on this world, had long since gone away. Apparently there were no newspapers. Pardon the distraction, I just saw a squirrel walking by. Squirrel. There were no squirrel, yeah. There were no newspapers. Of course not, because these people got all of their information from their phones. So she wouldn't find very likely any public bulletin boards for job searching. She wouldn't find anything until she tied into the local data network. So she pulled out her transponder, which was to the cell phone as the Apollo 11 was to the Kitty Hawk. This transponder could hook up to pretty much any data network if it could find a signal. And strictly enough, she had signal. She had an account. How was it being paid for? Well, you know, sometimes the ethics of the time court was such that you would just have to count on the fact that you would go back in time and pay for that service later. She started searching for the job sites and what she found were pretty sad prospects. If you had very specific advanced skills, there were opportunities for you which could be run if you were telecommuting from just about anywhere it looked like. There were other service jobs, but there were a lot of jobs which were basically, it looked like hard work for people that weren't going to be having other opportunities. So this is what they'd have to take. And that wouldn't do at all. Anthony needed people with more skill than that. You don't have ditch diggers put up cell towers. Yes, you need strong people putting up some of those cell towers, but you don't have ditch diggers. You don't have people who can't read a plan and can't do the math. So he needed someone who was more specialized. So where would he be searching? Not on the open job boards. It would have to be a search site. So she went through the catalogs, found search sites, found the three most prominent tech search sites and started going through listings for those. And on the second one, she found the listing for cellular equipment installers. She compared to other listings and found that the premium was being paid. These were going to be pretty good paying jobs with much travel involved. It was open about that. These were the jobs that clearly were what Anthony was using to build his cellular network in the other timeline. She looked and found where they were taking the applications, which of course was online. But she would assume at some point there would have to be face to face, if nothing else, to gather together to actually go to the new timeline. So therefore, since there was no place to find where Anthony was and where he was placing these and evaluating these, there was really only one way that Elise could chase them down. She was going to have to apply for a job herself. And at 7.53, I'm going to call that a pretty good breaking point for me to continue the story later. Oh, no fair. Yeah, you still have a ton of hair <laughs> wavy up to use. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that one got more involved, but come on. You know it was going to get involved when you said time portal. And then a <laughs> loose recipient? Oh, man. As, now I can't simply just go back in time and watch dinosaurs. Now I've got a hunt going on. <laughs> so, so that was a pretty fun one. I still have no idea where it's going. Um, I, I have some vague ideas. I kind of have my way of outlining a story, if you can call it outlining, is something I kind of call world lining. I base it off the concept of world lines in physics, 
where it's a map of where something is at time zero and where it can be. And so at time zero, your point is here. And it can't go faster than the speed of light. So it has to, in the future, be within those two, two lines. And then somewhere a year later, we track it and it's here. So now we know it can't be anywhere outside of these two lines. And then another year later, we track it here. And now we know it can't be outside of these two lines. That's the concept of a world line in physics. And that's sort of how I do my planning, if you want to call it that, for stories, is at some point, all of a sudden, I see, aha, I see a brilliant ending. Everything along the way has been simply responding to information as I make it up. And suddenly now, I look and say, well, if I were to go to, say, this point, yeah, let, let's put my brilliant ending out here. If I were to go to this point, I can't possibly hit my brilliant ending. Now I start seeing things that will keep me from getting there. So those ideas, I throw them out. All of this is going on in the background as I'm talking because I taught corporate training for about a decade. I've gotten really good at talking to you while thinking in the background where I'm going to go next. So I'm talking to you, telling you ideas, and at the same time, I'm throwing out now the ideas that I'm not sure where they're going to go. I haven't hit the brilliant idea for Elise yet, but I do like the idea that she is going to end up in the actual working, in, in the field with the workers on this alternate timeline, and now she's going to have to somehow stop Anthony from putting together his cellular network there and becoming emperor of a timeline. Questions? I'm envious of how much plot you're able to spin out just spontaneously like that. It would take me about a week to do it, I think. I, I understand it's entirely a different mindset that if I sit down and try to plan this out, I will sit and go nowhere. I will just absolutely go nowhere because all the possibilities come into my mind at once and I don't know where to go. For me, what moves me forward is motion forward. When you've given me those three elements of the character and the setting and the plot, that is what makes my actual plotting brain start working. And so as we go along the way, everything I'm adding to this is sort of piling up in, in the back of my brain, say, okay, now I can figure out what's happening next. It's a different mindset from a more traditional plotter. And I don't, I don't think it's anything either one of us can teach the other how we work. We can demonstrate it, but I don't know if we can teach it. And the worst that happens is if I really get stuck, although I didn't this time, I have the deck. I have the random things. I don't actually do that in my day-to-day -day writing, but you'll hear people who will talk about it. You'll hear people that have got story dice or plot books or stuff like that. I honestly just was impatient and didn't want to wait to get a set of plot cards that you could buy on Amazon, so I just printed up my own. Same concept. Other questions? Do you have an ending? I do not have an ending yet. Okay. I, I am. I, I, I can tell you this. I am generally an optimistic ending sort of person. So I can tell you she's going to catch him eventually. My thought is potentially we're going to find Mac and his assistants actually are in on the plot with him. I can sort of see that that could explain how all three of them have disappeared because that would then answer the question of how did Anthony go there and take the three of them out of commission? He didn't. They were collaborating. So I think yeah. that would happen, but I don't really know until I get there. One of the things I've always run across with trying to think on, on time travel stories, for me, the one I can't quite wrap my head around is say you want to go back in time and buy something that doesn't exist anymore. How do you get the money back in time? You can't bring bills. And if you go and buy old bills, it costs so much that 
you might as well just make a new one from scratch anyway. Well, I've seen arguments that, well, you can do the old bills if you don't care about the shape they're in. Yes, old bills are expensive, but generally when you're in the coin shop, the old bills that are expensive are the ones that are in good shape and so on. I've also seen versions where they go back even farther in time, do something that will get them paid for a day's worth of hard labor, invest it in a bank, and then come forward 12 years and pick up the investment that's earned interest for those 12 years. I thought that was a, cool. a more enterprising approach. You have to actually go back and earn that money and then let interest build up from there. I have to say I'm kind of in the Larry Niven camp, honestly, that I think time travel is inherently fantasy. That, that anything you try to do with it for science fiction, you will eventually reach an absolute contradiction where it just doesn't make sense. And, and the trick crazy. is how far can you both get away with that. Yeah. So, other questions? <laughs> If we have no other questions then, then it's time for me to give away a book. And we have got, looks like five participants. I need to die. Actually, I need a die or I need an Excel spreadsheet. Randomized. Yeah. Lucky, I, I, I could just go, you know, get that little uh, disc-shaped box that's sitting on, about five feet in front of me and ask it for a random number. It's 10 feet. But... <laughs> Computer, pick a number between one and five. Your random number between one and five is one. So there you go. All right. I'll take that one. I want to see oh. it. <laughs> My my Alexa heard you and just <laughs> <laughs> all right. But your Alexa answered first, so one would be Kathy Barrett. So yeah. Kathy, you will have your choice. You can have one of my books signed if I have it in stock, or you can have one of my books, paper or Kindle or Audible if it's available, Audible and Kindle, from Amazon your choice and you can go to my amazon page and find all 60 some titles that i'm in there so if you want to let me know which one we'll work that out right. other questions all right i am really glad you came i am always happy to have an audience some of you probably have already known me long enough to know that i'm a ham i love having an audience <laughs> Who, so, us? We think tell your friends. <laughs> How can we possibly do that? A great time you had, and and I will try to set this up probably Thursday night for another session, and then Sunday for a third session. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> it. And now, how do I make this go away? <laughs> Meeting. Meeting. Thank you. Thank you.